Kensington Palace, a royal residence for 329 years and now home to a very modern princess in waiting. Tucked away in a quiet corner of West London, Kensington has become the power base for the most popular royals in Britain. And as the American actress Meghan Markle prepares to join a long line of glamorous princesses who've lived there, her royal education will begin inside its gates. It's where two future kings currently live, where one of our longest serving monarchs was born and raised, and where Hollywood A-listers partied with Princess Margaret. Celebrities would just love to have an invitation to Kensington Palace. It's where another princess became an icon and a royal rebel. It really was like the first episode of the royal soap opera. Next to put Charles and I can't go wrong. He's there with me. And where its luxury surroundings became a prison instead of a sanctuary. They descended on Diana. Kensington Palace was effectively under siege from the paparazzi. In one of the royal's darkest hours, it was the focus for a country's grief. It was like suddenly like the nation's heartbeat was at Kensington Palace. But today, it's the scene of celebrations once again. And as the world's media descend for the wedding of the decade, a tougher, more modern royal is emerging from inside Kensington Palace. Hidden away in London's Kensington Gardens is the royal family's most exclusive and private building. Almost 100 years older than nearby Buckingham Palace, it's been a home for monarchs and their families since the 17th century. It's one of these almost anonymous royal palaces. It doesn't kind of scream out at you. It's rather like a very rambling country house. 400,000 visitors each year are allowed to walk through its state rooms. But the public areas are only a tiny fraction of the entire estate. What we never see is what makes Kensington Palace unique. Beyond the security cameras and high fences is the heavily guarded residential area, home to a whole array of princes and princesses. Kensington Palace is a complex of lots of different royal residences all glued together. It's a block of flats for the royal family, really. In fact, this most select of housing estates accommodates 12 royals. It consists of some surprisingly small cottages and the main building, where the grandest apartments are found. The apartments are pretty well separated. So if you walk out in your curlers, you won't bump into another member of the royal family. Apartment 10 has been home to the Queen's cousin, Prince Michael of Kent, for nearly 40 years. In 2016, three-bedroom Ivy Cottage was given a fresh lick of paint for its newest resident, eighth in line to the throne, Princess Eugenie. And across the square known as Clock Court are the two largest homes at Kensington Palace. Apartment one belongs to another of the Queen's cousins, the Duke of Gloucester. And the most senior royals in residence, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge and their two children, are next door in apartment 1A. Like many of the royals who lived here before them, William and Kate were keen to make their mark on the palace. They spent four and a half million pounds renovating the property, making it fit for a prince and princess. For most of us, an apartment or a flat would be maybe a bedroom or two and maybe a living room and some kind of small kitchen. In Kensington Palace, Kate and Wills' apartment is four storeys. There are thousands of pounds worth of rugs. There's a certain level of posh. This is not a normal couple's flat. This is a place that's got 18 sofas in the living room and it's got bomb-proof windows on the side that faces Kensington Gardens. Finally, 
one of the smallest and most unassuming properties in the palace, Nottingham Cottage. Since 2012, it's been occupied by William's brother, Prince Harry. Prince Harry lives in Nottingham Cottage, which is a little sort of two up, two down, bijou little place, which is perfect for a young, single, swinging man about town. It was a starter home, certainly a perfect bachelor pad. Um, it has a very sweet garden, Nottingham Cottage. And one of the first things Prince Harry did was put a hammock in it so he could chill out in the you know, spring and summer days. And he, you know, he very much made that apartment his own. But it wouldn't stay a bachelor pad forever. And in November 2017, Nottingham Cottage was the unlikely site of an historic event, one which would ultimately bring yet another princess to live at Kensington Palace. Uh, it happened uh, a few weeks ago here at, at our cottage. Um, it's a standard, typical night it's for a us. Cozy night. Well, Harry's proposal to Meghan, by his own account, was um, charmingly romantic. Harry did it in the kitchen, at home, while they were cooking a roast chicken. Uh, just an amazing surprise. It was so sweet and, and natural and very romantic. He got on one knee. <laughs> the fact that I fell in love with Meghan so incredibly quickly was a, was a sort of confirmation to me that that everything, everything, all the stars were aligned, everything was just perfect. It was this beautiful woman just sort of literally tripped and fell into my life. I <laughs> fell into her life. Compared to the rest of the royal estate, Harry's small cottage will be a humble start for a princess. We know from Harry being very open about wanting children that a family is on the agenda. And there's a lot of rumour that the Duke and Duchess of Gloucester's apartment, which is apartment one at Kensington Palace, will become available. And, of course, it's perfectly positioned right next to William and Kate's. Um, they really will be even closer than they are now. Already, Meghan's arrival has brought Hollywood glamour to the centuries-old palace. But not for the first time. In the 1960s, it was also home to one of the world's most stylish women. It was indeed a glittering occasion. And Londoners were there in great strength to see the arrival of the Princess Margaret. Princess Margaret was bigger than Diana in her day. Whatever she wore was copied. There were perfumes named after her and the lipsticks. Whatever she did made the front pages. Princess Margaret also made headlines with her choice of husband, trendy up-and-coming society photographer, Anthony Armstrong Jones. Everybody was extraordinarily surprised. Here she is, marrying a photographer. He'd been to Eton and all that, but he was not the expected match. After their wedding, the Queen gave this glamorous couple the keys to a grand London property in the royal estate, ushering in the beginnings of a new era for apartment 1A and the whole of Kensington Palace. But the party wouldn't last forever. Soon, scandal would bring shame and disgrace to the gates of Kensington. And a royal couple would change the image of the palace for decades. I, I, I'm amazed that she's uh, been brave enough to take me on. <laughs> and I suppose in love. Of course. <laughs> Whatever in love means. <laughs> Kensington Palace, a spectacular royal housing estate and ground zero for a 21st century royal revolution. Most notably home to the third and fourth generations of the House of Windsor. The most popular royals in Britain are about to be joined by the newest of a long line of princesses based at Kensington Palace, Prince Harry's fiancée, Meghan Markle. In the 1960s, Kensington Palace was at the centre of an earlier royal revolution. Princess Margaret and her photographer husband, Anthony Armstrong Jones, had been given the keys to the 20-bedroom apartment 1A. Unfortunately for Margaret and Tony, the palace back then resembled an old people's home, 
rattling around neglected apartments were ancient descendants of Queen Victoria. There was a sort of running royal gag. Kensington Palace was known as the aunt heap. There were all sorts of old aunts tucked away in various cubby holes waited on by equally ancient servants. It was a rather eccentric boarding house. Margaret and Tony were shocked when they first saw the state of their new apartment. It was far from fit for a modern princess. The last resident of apartment 1A was Princess Louise, the fourth daughter of Queen Victoria. She died at the age of 91 in 1939. So for 20 years, nothing had been done to that house at all. There were gaping holes in the floor. I mean, it was in such a mess. In the early 1960s, money was tight. The government agreed to fork out just 80,000 pounds on rebuilding apartment 1A. Margaret and Tony would have to take care of the interior design themselves. To garner positive press, they let it be known they were going to roll up their sleeves and get stuck in. There were a pair of mahogany doors that divided the drawing room and the dining room, and Tony did those with the help of Margaret. They varnished them and all the rest of it in a bid to keep the cost down. Three years later, Three bedrooms, nine staff bedrooms, four staff bathrooms, three kitchens, a photographic darkroom, and ten more rooms had been renovated. With the arrival of the couple's children, David and Sarah, day and night nurseries were also installed. But Kensington Palace wasn't going to become a quiet family home. Britain's capital was at the centre of a global cultural change, and the royal couple were firmly a part of it. Swinging London, by golly, did it swing when it swung. And at the apex of swinging London were Princess Margaret and Tony. They were invited to every premiere and party. But the hottest ticket in town was an invite back to Kensington Palace. They had parties with all the A-list people around. Rudolf Nureyev, Margot Fontaine, Frank Sinatra, Elizabeth Taylor, Peter Sellers and Britt Eklund. Anybody who was anybody would just love dying to have an invitation to Kensington Palace. <laughs> It was the first time that the arts and the establishment really met and mingled. The princess loved them. She was a very good pianist. They were great fun. Margaret and her husband may have transformed Kensington Palace and made it into a celebrity hotspot. But behind the glamorous veneer, their home life had become a struggle for both. From the start, the arrival of a working photographer into the royal household had caused resistance. As time went on, even Margaret's loyal staff made their feelings clear. Staff at Kensington Palace were a mixed lot. First of all was Margaret's dresser, she disapproved of Tony, so much so that when the princess was called, this used to be very much the custom you were called in grand houses, always with a cup of early morning tea. But the dresser who brought in the early morning tea would only bring in one cup. She thought the princess should have married a duke. And that wasn't all that was wrong between Margaret and Tony. Both were attracted to others within their social scene and their affairs would shatter their once happy marriage. The arguments started to become rather public. There was one occasion when she wanted to leave, he didn't. He hid under a table. 
it all became rather ugly. Eventually, it became clear to Margaret and Tony that their marriage was over. On the 24th of May, 1978, they did something that no royal couple had done for 400 years. They divorced. Margaret, now a single mother of two, retreated inside, and Kensington Palace fell silent. Princess Margaret was only the latest in a long line of royals to experience heartbreak at Kensington Palace. It was more than 300 years ago that King William III and Queen Mary II bought a small mansion in the countryside village of Kensington. Their aim? To escape the pollution of nearby London. Kensington at the end of the 17th century was still really rural a hamlet almost, and it's a long way away from the heart of things, and that's exactly what William and Mary wanted. William had a bad chest. He didn't like being in Whitehall, which was damp, it was smoggy, it was, it was a polluted part of the world. So they were in a hurry to find somewhere else. The King and Queen hired Britain's best architect, Sir Christopher Wren, to transform the then modest Nottingham House into a palace. By then, Wren was celebrated throughout the land. When Wren started working on Kensington Palace, he was nearly 60. He'd been architect to the crown for a couple of decades, and he's at the peak of his career. He's in the middle of rebuilding St Paul's Cathedral, which is without doubt the greatest building in the kingdom. He's the arbiter of taste in 17th century England. With William's health suffering in London, the king and queen wanted the palace completed as soon as possible. Wren was pushed very hard to make Kensington habitable within six months. That, that might not seem too much today. Think that St Paul's Cathedral took 35 years and Wren is being asked to remodel a palace at Kensington in months. To house the king, queen, and their 600 staff, he extended the original building by adding four pavilions and two large wings, eventually creating three new courtyards. This immediately changed not only the sort of function of it by making it bigger, but also it looked architecturally like something more impressive and elaborate and therefore became a home befitting a king. Wren's additions to the building transformed it forever. After a, a fire there in 1690, he adds on what's, what, what they called then the new gallery building, or they call it the King's Gallery. So he created a new south front, which is the best thing about Kensington Palace. The plain red brick, the sash windows, the Portland vases along the top are a perfect example of that English Baroque, which is an austere intellectual style. In 1692, the work was completed. But just two years later, tragedy struck the very first residence. Queen Mary had caught smallpox. To keep staff safe from the deadly virus, King William sent them away and tended to Mary himself. This was quite extraordinary, the fact that the reigning king would risk his life by attending his wife during such an illness, and the fact that he was prepared to put her above everything. Nine days after falling sick, Queen Mary died. Eight years later, her dutiful king would also be dead, succumbing to pneumonia caught at the palace. Although the lives of William and Mary were cut short, their creation has stood for more than three centuries as a home for other kings, queens, princes and princesses. And their legacy is also visible in the gardens that surround the palace today. They were both king gardeners. They both loved horticulture. They wanted to create gardens like the ones that they'd had at home in Hetlow in Holland. They wanted it to be a garden that would rival William's cousin. 
Louis XIV at Versailles. Kensington Palace Gardens still hold many little-known secrets. And it's not just royalty who have enjoyed a stroll along its paths. J.M. Barry, who wrote Peter Pan, um, had a long love affair with Kensington Gardens. On the north side of the palace are two stones, said by Barry in his world-famous series of Peter Pan books to be gravestones. He said that these were children who'd been locked into the park at night and then died of cold, and that it was actually Peter who decided to bury them together so that they wouldn't be lonely anymore. Well, that was the story Jay and Barry told, but actually they're boundary markers. Peter Pan was written just three years after the death of one of Kensington's most famous residents, Queen Victoria. When Victoria was born in May 1819, the palace was a far cry from the grand, impressive home it once was. In fact, it was falling apart. The palace had really fallen into disrepair because Victoria's various wicked drunken uncles had practically bankrupted the monarchy. When her mother asked her what she wanted for her birthday, she asked to have the windows cleaned. But young Victoria's greatest problem wasn't dirty windows. It was the plan hatched by her controlling mother. Princess Victoria of saxe coburg salfeld also known as the Duchess of Kent. It was all about control and keeping her own position and securing her own future by making sure that her, her daughter, the heir to the throne, was entirely dependent on her. The palace gave its name to a strict set of rules the Duchess imposed on Victoria. It became known as the Kensington System and it was ruthlessly enforced by the Duchess and her most senior staff. You've got an ambitious Duchess of Kent who wanted to be the power behind the throne of the young Queen Victoria when she succeeded her uncle William IV. The Kensington system meant that in the public eye, the Duchess and her daughter were to be absolutely inseparable. Victoria wasn't allowed to walk downstairs on her own. She wasn't allowed to sleep alone. The Duchess designed the system to make Victoria rely on her totally. She hoped that when the young princess became queen, she could continue to control her. But her plan ended in disaster. They drove a wedge between mother and daughter. And more than 100 years later, another princess would face her own battle for control at Kensington Palace. There was no sign of the Princess of Wales this morning. She appears to be keeping a low profile. Life for Diana inside Kensington Palace was very much that of an open prison. Kensington Palace has stood for 329 years as home to minor and major royalty. In the 19th century, it also lent its name to a strict method of royal child rearing, which became known as the Kensington system. The thinking behind the Kensington system was that the Duchess of Kent exerted influence over the young Victoria. It cannot be denied that the Duchess of Kent was ambitious. But if she was ambitious for herself, she was even more ambitious for her daughter. And this was in preparation for Victoria becoming queen. In 1837, after 18 years of living under the system, Victoria was woken to be told her uncle was dead and she was now queen. Finally, it was the moment Victoria's mother hoped she would seize control as the power behind her daughter. Sadly, for the Duchess of Kent, the Kensington system was an absolute disaster. It had produced precisely the popular, fresh young monarch who the people craved. And because Victoria was so popular, it also gave her the confidence to reject her mother. This whole system worked, but it also drove a wedge between mother and daughter to the extent that when Victoria ascended the throne, Three weeks later, 
she moved out of Kensington Palace and into Buckingham Palace, becoming the first sovereign to live there. The Kensington system had failed the Duchess, as Victoria sidelined her mother completely. But the palace itself had helped shape one of Britain's greatest ever monarchs. And remarkably, her strong family connection to the palace lived on there until 1981. Princess Alice of Athlone kept herself very much to herself. Um, people wouldn't really have known who she was. The fascinating thing about that she never had a car. This never phased Princess Alice. She always went around on the number nine or the number 52 bus. There was one famous occasion. Princess Marina was returning in her Rolls Royce. She said to her um, chauffeur, Look, there is Princess Alice, do stop. So she said, Auntie Alice, we're, we're going back, would you like a lift? And Princess Alice looked up and scanned the sky and she said, I don't think so, me and I'll take the bus, it's a lovely day. How many people I sometimes used to wonder, standing in the bus queue, realised that this was Queen Victoria's last grandchild. As Princess Alice saw out her final days inside Kensington Palace, a new, more modern face of royalty was preparing to move in. In February 1981, King-in-waiting Prince Charles announced his engagement to Lady Diana Spencer. When the couple stepped in front of the cameras, the world was enchanted by this modern-day fairy tale. The popularity of the Prince and Princess of Wales at the time of their marriage was, was off the scale. I think the Charles and Diana story really kicked off the soap opera element of the royal family. I think the reporting became less deferential. It really was like the first episode of the royal soap opera. Charles and Diana immediately started planning their future together. Charles had been living at Buckingham Palace, like all the Queen's children had, and he'd gone to the Queen and said he wanted a home where he could raise a family, and so a very large apartment was earmarked for them at Kensington Palace. Diana and Charles were the world's biggest celebrities, so to have them in a place which was easily accessible to the public, remember, it's right next to Kensington Gardens, so people can walk past it all the time, you can look in the windows, you could wave at her if you felt like it. Lady Diana's father this morning said he thought she'd make a very good housewife. Oh, said that. <laughs> <laughs> We've yet to see. As heir to the throne, Charles and his wife Diana were entitled to the grandest property on the royal housing estate. But Princess Margaret lived in apartment 1A. So Charles and Di were given keys to the next largest, the combined apartments 8 and 9 and immediately set about making them fit for a princess. Diana was going to have the, the, the final say on decorating Kensington Palace apartment. She got her mother in to help, and she brought in an interior designer called Dudley Poplack, and he chose the fabrics uh, and the colour schemes. It was all done with a great deal of style and, and panache. In June 1982, interest in Kensington Palace went into overdrive when a new resident arrived, Prince William. It was a joyful moment, but just four weeks after William's birth, peaceful family life was dramatically shattered when a terror attack rocked the Wales's apartment. The bomb went off two soldiers killed along with seven horses. The effect was devastating. The IRA blew up a detachment of guardsmen still etched on the memory. Dead horses, dead guardsmen, horrifying. This was the latest IRA terror atrocity on British streets. The bomb was designed to kill as many as possible and was packed around with nails. They had exploded a bomb on the road leading directly to Kensington Palace and royal security was ill-equipped to deal with such a devastating attack. In those days, the Queen was guarded by a man who didn't carry a gun but a rolled-up umbrella. And the security at Kensington Palace was so lax that if they were sent a padded envelope, 
one of the members of staff will be told to throw the, the envelope uh, against the wall and sh quickly shut the door. And that was their way of testing to see if there was a bomb inside. The fears are now that this may herald the start of a new IRA terror campaign in London. With the bomb exploding so close to Kensington, shockwaves were sent through royal security. Their greatest fear was that the next target could be Kensington Palace itself. Everybody in public life was a potential candidate for assassination. And there was a significant threat level against members of the royal family. Now, royalty protection was increased in its numbers. There was almost a bottomless pit of cash and equipment was available. In the aftermath of the blast, Kensington Palace was transformed from a relaxed royal home into a fortress. Access to the Waleses was now tightly controlled. Every palace press call was under strict supervision. Prince William had brought a ball along to play with, but all that really interested him were the cameras. Restricted access for royal reporters meant any news coming out of the palace was thin on the ground. Most of the time in the royal family, they don't want stories to get into the public domain. Since the sort of the, the, the heyday of the press in the, in the 40s and 50s and 60s, the royal family have come to realise they have to deal with it. The proud parents with their baby son and heir, David, Albert, Charles, Viscount Lindley. To accept that there's going to be some intrusion and that there is a benefit to that, which is that if it's handled correctly, the royal family remains something that has public support in the UK. Uh, the job is to try and paper over the cracks and keep, on a, keep, keep a happy face and keep the ship sailing. You got a glimpse of family life, I suppose. There was no question and answers about how life was going. You got what you were shown, which was William can now crawl, William can now walk. In 1984, after the birth of Prince Harry, access was restricted further. For the press, the only regular glimpse of the young princes was on the school run. Kensington Palace for the young boys became an important sanctuary. William and Harry loved their times at Kensington Palace. We'd often see a little rifle come round the corner, followed by Prince Harry wearing the latest para uniform that he'd been given. And they used to like hosepipe fights when they were washing the cars. They go watch the helicopters, and there was always an unwilling detective cajoled into a fight. My room was very close to the nursery, and there was this sort of continual movement of young children, bored with their nanny. And I remember Harry knocking on my door one day and saying, Ken, I'm bored. So I gave him a radio and said, look, go and see the chauffeur. Twenty minutes later, I was rather worried that he hadn't come back. Now, this is where panic sets in. Harry, come in, Harry. So I called him up on the radio and he answered. I said, oh, where are you, Harry? He said, just a moment. And suddenly, I don't know, he said, I'm outside Tower Records in Ken Church Street. Well, I don't think I've ever moved as fast in my life. And there, in his khaki uniform, with his beret on and his radio was Harry. We got away with that one. Relief for the royal staff, but there were more turbulent times ahead. As Charles and Diana's marriage began to falter, the rebel princess took control of the palace and banished many of those whose job it was to protect her. She did the most extraordinary thing. She had the locks changed on Kensington Palace. Kensington Palace, soon to be home to a new princess, Prince Harry's American fiancée, Meghan Markle. Over centuries, the palace has played host to many different kinds of resident. In the 1940s, the military moved in.
during World War II, the capital was rocked by German bombing raids. Kensington Palace was shut down. Its royals evacuated to the countryside, and it was converted into a heavy artillery base. There were anti-aircraft guns at the palace, there were the barracks behind, and there was a detachment of Royal Air Force. So it was quite a heavily garrisoned area. On the 4th of October, 1940, as London burned, Kensington Palace was nearly wiped out. An incendiary bomb ignited, setting the palace on fire. It was the first of many hits the palace took. And by the end of the war, large parts lay in ruins. In 1945, London began its rebuilding. But work wouldn't start on the palace for another 11 years. There was a sense that the royals couldn't jump the queue or be seen to kind of get their own house in order before everybody else. And so it did take time to bring about the repairs, but that was seen as very much the right thing to do. But could Kensington Palace have a secret wartime past? Historians like Helen Fry believe that it does and that it served as more than just an artillery base during the war. There's an area behind Kensington Palace, the paddock, that George VI signed off permission for the War Office to use the north end of the paddock for special purposes. This secret request for the palace's land came on behalf of a little-known department of military intelligence known as MI-19. This covert group was responsible for the detention of German prisoners of war on British soil. MI-19 also seized control of three grand houses next to the palace. The houses became known as the London Cage. Cage is like a slang for interrogation quarters, and it was there that over 3,000 German prisoners of war and high-ranking Nazi war criminals were interrogated. MI-19 had taken over the grounds in order to make them part of their hidden prisoner of war camp to house and exercise German POWs. We know from aerial photography that there was barbed wire, it was heavily guarded, it was secluded from the public eye. But behind locked doors, this undercover prisoner of war camp in the heart of Kensington may have held an even darker secret. Helen Fry believes German prisoners were marched into the neighboring houses for brutal interrogation. Prisoners were told to write down their version of events. If a prisoner was really uncooperative, he'd be taken down into the basement hooded. It was down there in converted cells and interrogation rooms where some of the prisoners were struck or they had to stand for 28 hours. Some were starved. There was bright light treatment, like a Soviet-style prison. Pretty horrific. The walls of Kensington Palace have concealed many secrets, and the role played there by MI19 is just one of them. In the early 90s, its most famous residents were leading double lives. The resulting strains on the Prince and Princess of Wales would nearly bring the royal family to its knees. Charles and Diana were very good at doing their formal stuff together very well. They could do these engagements almost like clockwork. But the truth was that just four years after their wedding, Charles and Diana's marriage had self-destructed, and privately they were living apart. If Charles and Diana went out on an engagement, Diana would go back to Kensington Palace and Charles would go back to Highgrove. 
he didn't spend any time under the same roof of her, probably after about 18 months after Harry was born. With Charles at his Gloucestershire home, Highgrove, and the princes at boarding school, Diana was isolated at Kensington Palace. Unhappy and frustrated, she decided to get her story out in the open. The messenger would be a young journalist named Andrew Morton. The motivation was to tell the truth. For once, forget the propaganda, tell the truth about what's really going on, because we do face a crisis in the House of Windsor. It's obvious to everyone. Life for Diana inside Kensington Palace was very much that of an open prison. She felt that she was living a lie, that uh, her marriage was a lie, and that she wanted to tell her story. She did so entirely without the knowledge of the royal press machine. Uh, I would prepare questions for Diana, and they would be taken on, along to Kensington Palace by a friend of hers, and so would not arouse any suspicion. And he would sit there in her sitting room. She would put on her uh, a microphone, and he would just go through a list, the list of questions. She denied categorically to me that she had given Andrew Morton any help whatsoever. She denied it to her brother-in-law, who was the Queen's private secretary. She denied it to everybody, and we believed her. You don't turn around to a sort of a member of the royal family and say you're lying. On the 16th of June, 1992, Andrew Morton's book, Diana, Her True Story, was released. It was an unprecedented scoop in which Diana revealed her eating disorders, multiple suicide attempts, and the breakdown of her marriage. There was no sign of the Princess of Wales this morning. She appears to be keeping a low profile. Andrew Morton's book about the Princess of Wales changed everything. What he was saying, uh, was copper-bottomed, as we say in the trade. It really was from the horse's mouth. I'd driven to London, Charing Cross, to pick up the first edition um, and read it. She phoned me around about five o'clock in the morning, on the Sunday morning, she said, what do I do? I said, well, you've already done it. Go and pour yourself a stiff scotch and drink it. Diana's revelations from Kensington were the first attack in what became known as the War of the Waleses. The paparazzi descended on Diana. They wanted to know what she was doing at all times of day and night. Kensington Palace was effectively under siege from the paparazzi. It was the start of a sort of roller coaster of her saying, him saying, her saying. There wasn't a lot you could do about it. They were a bit like unguided missiles. Charles used Highgrove to launch his attacks, whilst Diana's missives were issued from London. During this turbulent time, the Waleses formally separated and the princess took control of their former marital home. She did the most extraordinary thing. She had the locks changed on Kensington Palace. All Charles' staff have keys and she didn't want them poking around and she didn't want them, bluntly, in her home. Afraid her every movement was being reported back to Charles, the princess made a bold decision she sacked her police protection. Diana increasingly found her police protection oppressive. Rightly or wrongly, she felt that um, they reported on her, that because they were with her 24 hours a day, they were in a position to tell Charles what she was up to. All the policemen were linked to Prince Charles. So the whereabouts of the princess in London whom she met, who she saw, who she entertained, everything was sent back to Prince Charles. And the princess said, I had enough of it. She said, I'm sorry, I, I do not want him to know where I'm going. This is my life, not his. But as Diana quickly discovered, maintaining her privacy would be impossible. Outside of the gates at Kensington Palace, she was being besieged by not only the paparazzi, but by members of the public. But she wanted to try and put her feet into this world of normality. Princess Diana was at her gym again. The photographers weren't happy. Very funny, Mum! Woohoo! Diana was in a difficult situation because she'd been playing with the press. 
And then she decided she didn't want to, and she experienced what a lot of celebrities have done, which is to realise that you can't have one and not the other. You, you play the game or you don't play the game. In June 1994, Diana was at Kensington Palace preparing to leave for a public engagement. There, she watched a TV interview in which Charles admitted to the nation that he had been unfaithful to her. It was the biggest sensational interview ever. She said to me, he's telling the world our marriage was a sham. That's what he's telling them. She said, I can't go out there. I can't face the press. She said, I've got nothing to wear. I said, you're going to face them. I said, I'll find you something to wear. So I went into her wardrobe and pulled out the Christina Strombolian dress. I said, this is what you're going to wear, and you're going to knock him dead. I said, go out there, hold your head high, shoulders back, put out your hand and say to yourself, I'm Diana, I'm here to stay. She did it. She did it. She went out there and she lifted her head high. Good girl. November 1995, a year after Charles's tell-all interview, a van arrived at Kensington Palace. Inside were two men claiming to be hi-fi salesmen. Princess Diana was expecting them. The next morning I arrive and I notice the furniture's been moved. I noticed these things. Why is that tea like that? Why is that table there? I thought this is very strange. And the whole country stopped. And they all took a deep breath and they sat in front of their TVs and watched Panorama. From Diana's drawing room at Kensington, the War of the Waleses had gone nuclear. 23 million people watched Diana blow the lid off life at Kensington Palace, blaming Charles's affair with Camilla for the downfall of their marriage and admitting her own infidelities. It did exactly what she wanted to do. There were three of us in this marriage and the thing. It was brilliant. It's a fantastic bit of PR. And it was PR she had masterminded by herself. They did the interview secret. No one knew about it. No one. Not her private secretary, none of her staff, nobody. She was totally alone inside the palace with the crew. It's quite hard to think of anything comparable to the Panorama interview. Henry VIII getting rid of most of his wives would have uh, counted had there been a popular press in his day. It certainly destroyed the image of the royal family. Yes, you can read something and the book goes down on a table, it goes into the bookshelves and you forget about it and you read another book. But the visual impact of, uh, of a broadcast uh, is, is second to none. The fallout from the interview was huge. A month after Diana's TV appearance, the princess received a letter from the Queen. This wasn't a letter offering advice. This was an instruction. This was the queen being the queen. I have taken advice from my prime minister and the Archbishop of Canterbury. And we both feel that it is in the country's best interest if, if you and Charles were divorced. That's how it read. She was devastated. On the 28th of August, 1996, the Wales' marriage was formally dissolved. But the drama wasn't over. Soon, Kensington Palace would witness the death of two princesses. One triggered an extraordinary event in British history. Thank you so much. The other would result in the keys being passed to a new generation of royals. On the 31st of August, 1997, Princess Diana was killed in a car crash in Paris. Kensington Palace 
her home for the previous 16 years became a focus for the nation's grief. The Royal Tribute started arriving about five o'clock in the morning. Now I lived up at Kensington Palace and when I went home that night, I walked into Kensington Gardens to have a look and it was a buzz of people. And there were night candles burning all over the place and there was already a carpet of flowers. Every hour, the floral tributes grew. Soon, they were a meter and a half deep, covering the palace gates. And by the end of the week, there was a lake of flowers. People might go home for a bit, and then they were coming back again. I mean, I saw the same people. What had started here, with a few bouquets laid at the palace gates, has transformed itself into the world's most powerful visual display, expressing grief. I remember sitting inside Kensington Palace and the smell of lilies and flowers coming into the apartment. It was, it was overwhelming. And I thought, my goodness, that was all she ever wanted in her life, was to be told, you're loved. And today the crowds were still flooding in. Critics sort of described it as this kind of mass hysteria. This is the center of London and people are just stopping and sobbing. It was a very un-English expression of public grief. And today it has carried over into other celebrity tragedies. Before Diana's funeral, the decision was made to take her body back to Kensington Palace. When she came home, I felt that was right. I felt as if I could take care of her once more for the last time. I put one hand on the coffin and I felt as if her presence was in that room. So I had a dress book to read. A, Attenborough. I said, do you remember that day when he flew you in a helicopter? Adams, Brian Adams, remember him? Oh, well, do you remember what he said to you that night? Well, I can't repeat that, but. It was a journey through the princess's life, right down to X, Y, and Z. It was a final goodbye. On the morning of the funeral, Princes William and Harry were taken to see the flower memorials and to meet well-wishers. William. William! Thank you so much. They come back to their own home. They didn't go inside the palace, they just came to the gardens and to marvel and to be astonished, as indeed they were, by the sea of flowers. And yet it was heartbreaking too, because here were these young boys who'd suddenly lost their mother. The world had been clamoring for a glimpse of them all week. There's a saying in royal circles, you don't wear private grief on a public sleeve. And by goodness, they show that. They were probably hurting inside, but they talked to people, they smiled at people, they thanked them for remembering their mother. And whether it met their uh, desire to know that the public was sharing their grief, or whether it was an appalling intrusion into their grief, um, perhaps only they can say. After the funeral, Princes William and Harry left their beloved childhood home with all of its memories to live with their father at Highgrove. It would be another 14 years before they would be back living at Kensington Palace. Diana's apartment was stripped. Every single possession, every coat hanger, every light bulb, every light fitting, the carpets, the underfelt, everything. But it became a more sadder building for it. In the aftermath, Charles proposed radical plans to transform Kensington Palace. Charles's view was that Kensington Palace should be 
emptied of all the royal relatives and it should become a permanent home for the royal collection of arts, antiques and other treasures. But the plans never came to fruition. Did the Queen oppose the move? If so, that would explain why her relatives were allowed to stay. Nearly five years later, on the 9th of February 2002, Kensington suffered yet another loss. Princess Margaret, who had first brought the palace into the modern era, died at the age of 71. In the enclosed area of clock cores, all the windows had candles, and members of the household staff also stood outside with candles as the princess's coffin left clock court. Margaret's apartment 1A became another empty home at Kensington and would remain so for more than a decade. During the 80s and 90s, Kensington was a place of turmoil for many. But for one young royal, it held happy memories. So perhaps it's no surprise that in June 2013, Prince William moved back home. Having married Kate, Duchess of Cambridge, William decided that Kensington Palace would once again be a home fit for a princess. William always knew that he wanted his married life, his family life, to be based at Kensington Palace, which is hardly surprising when you think about it. I think it's a really rather lovely tribute that Diana's sons have wanted to start their married lives there, continue their family lives there, make it their court. Today, Kensington Palace is once again a power base for the royal family. And as the nation awaits a fairy tale wedding and the crowning of a hugely popular American princess. This beautiful woman just sort of literally tripped and fell into my life. I <laughs> fell into her life. All eyes will be on this historic home. For more than three centuries, Kensington Palace has been home to members of the royal family. It was built by Britain's greatest architect to be fit for the king and queen. And for the first hundred years of its life, it was the favoured residence for the monarch of the day. But when Victoria was crowned and left for Buckingham Palace, it would be more than 100 years before a senior royal lived there again. In the 21st century, Kensington's fortunes have ebbed and flowed. And now this exclusive building is once again at the heart of the monarchy's future. It's finally actually home to the two generations in William and George, who are going to one day be the core of the royal family and, and carry the monarchy on. And that's a huge step up for Kensington Palace to be that important. The reinvention of the palace began with a multi-million pound refurbishment and continued with a memorial exhibition. Even 20 years after Princess Diana's death, there is still a huge interest in the princess. Of course it was, she was the most famous person in the world. In May 2017, a set of Diana's most famous dresses were put on public display near the memorial garden. Hundreds of thousands of visitors have queued to see them. Everywhere you turned, there was a memory of Diana. That was the dress that she danced with Travolta in. You know, that was her wedding dress. For me, it was really a great pleasure to dress Diana. One of my favorite dresses that I made for the princess has to be the little blue dress. It was a silk georgette dress with tiny bugle beads. It was very low on the décolletage and it was very high on the knee length. She loved trying on new clothes, and she got really excited, which in turn excited me too. And of course, you know, there was always the sort of the big reveal when she would actually appear in front of public wearing your dress. What an impact she's making, as usual. 
Far from simply being a museum to their mother, the brothers have ensured that Kensington Palace is firmly positioned on a global stage. It's here that William and Harry have welcomed some of the world's most powerful people, including, in 2016, the Obamas. This is the leader of the free world, the President of the United States, coming to Kensington Palace for supper with the Cambridges, the number one glamour couple in the world. I think both sides were reflecting in each other's, other's glory, if you like. It was a good photo call for America, and it was a very good photo call for Great Britain. When the former president and first lady were taken inside, we were offered a rare glimpse of life behind the doors of this hidden home. People have this idea of what a palace must be like, but it's not like that. Kensington Palace is a real home. It was actually the first time that we got to see inside Kensington Palace after this incredibly expensive refurbishment and actually very charmingly got to see Kate interact with George. There's a lovely picture of her crouching down while George is on a rocking horse and he's obviously ready for bed in his pyjamas and his dressing gown. But the publication of photos of the royal children was criticised by some. If you spend a lot of time arguing that your child's privacy shouldn't be invaded, then publishing a photograph of them in a dressing gown in their own private home, are you sure you want to do this? The photo call was an early example of the young royals taking charge of their media relations. After witnessing their mother's fraught relationship with the press, William and Harry have been keen to manage their own in a different way. It's inarguable that the way the press behaved with Diana and Diana behaved with the press has influenced William and Harry's attitudes towards the media. Kensington Palace tweeted earlier that they'd also like to thank everyone for their warm wishes. In the 80s, everything that came out media-wise came out of Buckingham Palace. There was one press office, and the one press office catered for every member of the royal family. But now, Kensington has its own press team. They now have a sort of little mini court, Harry and William, at Kensington Palace. They want to control the media, because they have seen from their mother that if you can control the message, that you get your side out there. In 2015, the Duke of Cambridge used his personal communications team to issue a notice, to press and public alike. Prince William put out a statement asking for more privacy and detailing some of the things that photographers had done in order to get photographs of his children. They are going directly to the public. You know, that press statement went out on Twitter. They realise that they've got a voice through their social media and they're going to use it. If you can persuade the public that they are being mistreated, then you may perhaps stop the appetite for buying the magazines in the first place, which reduces the market for the paparazzi pictures in the long run. With Harry's American fiancé, Meghan Markle, about to join the newest royal court, media interest in Kensington Palace and the royals is higher than at any time since Diana. Marrying Meghan Markle, it's a massive step for the monarchy because she breaks the mold in, in many ways. She's an actress, she's a philanthropist, she's an American, she's a divorcee. But I think it goes so much deeper than that. Meghan, from everything we've seen about her, is a feminist. She's a very modern woman. She's got great ambitions, I think, to do a lot of very good work. The causes that have been very important to me, I can focus even more energy on because very early out of the gate, I think you realize once you have access or a voice that people are willing to listen to, with that comes a lot of responsibility. I, I know the fact that she'll be really unbelievably good at the job part of it um, is obviously a huge, huge relief to me because she'll be able to deal with, with everything else that comes with it. But the royal couple's tolerance for the spotlight has been tested since the beginning. 
Just a week after news of Harry's relationship broke, the Kensington Palace media machine rolled into action again in an attempt to bring the press and unusually social media into line. Prince Harry put a statement out saying that he was very unhappy about the reporting of his relationship with the American actress Meghan Markle, saying that he felt some of it was racist. When Harry put out his statement about Meghan, uh, it worked to change the public mood because it was so angry. Had it gone through the Buckingham Palace press office and the Queen probably wouldn't have been allowed to go out because it went through his own office in Kensington Palace, he was able to express his opinion. I think both of us were totally surprised by the, the reaction after the first five, six months of what we had to ourselves. While the nation waits for the wedding of the decade, for now, a truce holds between the British press and the royals of Kensington Palace. Harry and Meghan will start life as a married couple at Kensington Palace, and I think it's um, I think it's going to be a very, very exciting place to watch. You've got two gloriously glamorous royal couples, two beautiful royal children, more on the way. Everything's gone full circle, and William and Harry have both returned to a place which they loved very much. Their childhood memories are built at Kensington Palace, and now they're giving those memories, well, well, certainly William is, he's giving those memories to his own children. I think you're gonna see a very close bond between these four royals. They've been dubbed the Fab Four, and um, it's a very exciting time. More than three centuries after its construction, this grand royal building is now firmly back at the forefront of royal life. With a new generation in residence and its importance and influence set to become even bigger, Britain's most popular royals have come together to ensure that Kensington Palace is once again fit for a princess. the scene of celebrations once again. And as the world's media descend for the wedding of the decade, a tougher, more modern royal is emerging from inside Kensington Palace. Hidden away in London's Kensington Gardens is the royal family's most exclusive and private building. Almost 100 years older than nearby Buckingham Palace, it's been a home for monarchs and their families since the 17th century. It's one of these almost anonymous royal palaces. It doesn't kind of scream out at you. It's rather like a very rambling country house. 400,000 visitors each year are allowed to walk through its staterooms, 
But the public areas are only a tiny fraction of the entire estate. What we never see is what makes Kensington Palace unique. Beyond the security cameras and high fences is the heavily guarded residential area, home to a whole array of princes and princesses. Kensington Palace is a complex of lots of different royal residences all glued together. 